pray with me? The Lord, our rock and our redeemer, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are not innocent of your son's blood. We who gather here tonight know, we confess that we, even though thousands of years later, are just as guilty, just as present in that crowd. For every day we we rebel, we resist. We, we turn away from you rather than repent and turn toward you. Oh Lord, by the example of your son Jesus Christ, by his word, turn us around and help us to see, O oh God, by his example, how you would have us to live. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For it is in the name of your Son, our crucified and risen Savior, that we pray. Amen. I had a really interesting and a really great experience yesterday morning. I had the opportunity with a group of other pastors from San Antonio from around the city to have bre breakfast with a rabbi during Holy Week, just a couple of days before Passover. His name is Rabbi David Komanovsky, and he is the, the rabbi of Temple High. It's an offshoot or a, a satellite of Temple Bethel. I'm not going to get into all of the details, but but over the course of the morning, we had some great conversations. I really liked him a lot. And one of the things that we acknowledged as part of this conversation, as part of trying to really get to know one another and be authentic with each other, is that we had to acknowledge that there is a very fundamental difference between the way he approaches this week and the way I approach this week. There's a very fundamental difference in the way that I understand Jesus and the way he understands Jesus. Jesus. Let me explain. He believes that the Messiah is yet to come, and I believe that the Messiah has already come, that he is Jesus the Christ. But it was good to have that conversation. It was good to get that out on the table, and you know what? He's a great guy. He has a great sense of humor, and we didn't argue about it, not that time. He didn't argue with me. He didn't try to convince me that Jesus is not the Messiah. But you know what he said? He said, well, you know what? If you believe that a Jewish person gave his life to save the world, be like him. If you believe that a Jewish person gave his life to save the world, then be like him. Be like that person. I thought to myself, what a great explanation of discipleship. If we believe that this particular Jewish person, that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, gave his life to save the world, to save other people, be like him. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? It means to be like him. On that week that we call Holy Week, that Passover week, our rabbi, our teacher, Jesus the Christ, gave us a master class on humility. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus called his disciples together to share an annual Passover meal. And then, as we've heard, after supper, Jesus took the bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke the bread, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of you all of it, and do this, as, and as often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And we have that story from Matthew, from Mark, and from Luke. But then the Apostle John reports something that Matthew, Mark, and Luke leave out. He says that after supper, Jesus laid aside his outer garments. 
And taking a towel, he tied it around his waist, and then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, in a modern context, if we said that a man had taken, out his, uh, taken off his outer garments, it would be as if a man took off his suit coat, he took off his tie, he took off his shirt, even took off his pants. And that's what Jesus did. He took out, off his outer garments, and all he was left with was a loincloth. And in short, he assumed the garb of a slave. Now, first of all, it was weird that in this context, Jesus started stripping off his clothes, and then he did something really extraordinary, bordering on taboo. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You see, washing feet was the job of slaves, not the job of leaders, not the job of teachers or heads of households or anyone like that. Jesus, Jesus basically took on the role of the lowliest person in the house. And this is what he said to them. He said, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Now, of course, Peter protested because Peter was always protesting. Whenever Jesus said something profound, it seems like Jesus is the first one to say, no, 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 Lord, you don't understand. But Jesus, I mean, Peter protested. He said, you're never going to wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I do not wash you, you have no share in me. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And then Jesus said, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do also just as I have done to you and you should do for one another just as i have done to you now following that jesus made a truly cryptic but chilling announcement he said truly truly i say to you one of you will betray me and later he told peter that he and the others would deny him and abandon him you know now unless you're in a movie or a sitcom you don't usually start accusing people of betrayal and abandonment at a holiday gathering but then Jesus, excuse me, then Judas got up and left. Well, after that, as you've heard from our readings tonight, after that it seemed that the world began to fall off of its axis. They went to the garden to camp, but then after Jesus came back from his prayers, Judas came out of the night with a company of soldiers to arrest Jesus, and then the disciples abandoned him, and Peter denied him. He was taken to be tried by the temple leaders. He was dragged all over the city from Herod's to, to Pilate's, from Herod's to Pilate's, and back and forth. He was, he was whipped. He was mocked. He was tortured. He was betrayed by his own people who chose Barabbas over him. He chose a terrorist over a teacher who proclaimed, crucify him, crucify him crucify him and then he was frog marched to the hill of Golgotha where he was nailed naked to a cross to die all of that happened that night but as we think back to earlier that night there's some important lessons that our teacher wanted us to know as the rest of these things will unfold over the next few days the word mandi comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means simply commandment. And we call this night Maundy Thursday because this is the night when we remember that Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. That night, after he washed their feet, he told them this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then he said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Earlier that night, Jesus had taken a towel. He had taken water and he washed the disciples' feet. Earlier that night, he had taken bread and a cup and he said, he said this represents my body. This represents my blood, which is going to be given for you. And he said, do you see this? Me, your Lord and teacher, washing your feet. Do you see this? Do this. Do you see me humbling myself and serving you? Do this for one another. 
This is my command to you this night. See this, do this, for I have given you an example. The Lord's new commandment is to love one another just as he has loved us. What does that mean? What does that mean that he says that we're to love one another just as Jesus loved us? Well, he gave us a model that night. He gave us an illustration of this very concept that night. The first thing that Jesus did before he washed their feet was he stripped himself. The Apostle Paul wrote that even though he was in the form of God, God did not, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus not only stripped off his clothes, that was a reflection of what he had already done. He had already stripped himself from heaven. Even though, John writes at that moment, even the Father had given all things into his hands, Jesus stood before them, stripped and vulnerable. He had come down from heaven. He had left the holy precincts. He had made himself hunger. He had made himself vulnerable to hunger. He made himself vulnerable to ridicule. He'd made himself vulnerable to discomfort. He'd made himself vulnerable to, to betrayal. He'd made himself vulnerable to pain. He'd made himself vulnerable to death. Jesus Christ stripped away every scrap of divine dignity that separated divinity from humanity so that he could restore our relationship with the Father. Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake, for your sake, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. The Son of God stripped himself. He laid aside all the protections of his power, all of the privileges of his divinity, all of the attention of his glory to save us. What are you holding back? What am I hiding? What are we protecting? If we really want to love like, like Jesus loves, then we need to be prepared to strip all of that away, to take away everything that separates us one from another for the sake of love, for the sake of loving one another. See this. Do this. John then tells us that he stooped down and he took hold of the disciples' feet and he washed them. He washed them. He, he actually took water and he grabbed their feet and he washed them. Jesus showed his love for us by stooping down and being with us by becoming one of us god did not send a stand-in god did not send a stunt double he gave himself the word became flesh and dwelt among us the word became flesh so that he could walk in our shoes he did not express his love from a safe distance he got involved he got involved in the lives of tax collectors and carpenters, and fishermen, and prostitutes, and soldiers, and cripples, and lepers, and women, and children, and foreigners, and even in the lives of, even in the lives of lawyers and preachers. He got involved. He put his hands on skin. He put his hands on legs. He put his hands on, eye, his, on eyes, and he put his hands even on the feet of those he came to serve. And he invested in their health. He invested in their growth. He invested in their joy. See this. Do this. Who is God calling you to stoop down to? Where is that place beyond your comfort zone that God is calling you? If you believe that a Jewish person gave his life to save other people, be like him. How do we love like him? The story tells us we get involved in the lives of others. 
with the love and truth of Jesus Christ. If we want to love like him, we can't be spectators. We can't be bystanders. We can't be commentators or critics or voyeurs. We have to actually get invo- involved in people's lives. Get involved in the life of that teenager. Get involved in the life of that homeless lady. Get involved in the lives of that young couple. If we want to love like Jesus, we have to get involved in people's lives. We have to stoop down and invest. But we also have to strip our lives of the things that separate us from one another. If you want to get involved in people's lives, you have to strip your schedule. You have to, you have to clear your calendar. You have to release your competing obligations and distractions. You have to strip off the mask that you wear, this portrait of yourself that you think you other people want to see. You have to strip off your pride. You have to strip off your reputation and your social status and even your security. You have to strip off your power. You have to strip off your comfort. You have to strip off your safety. You have to strip off all of your excuses so that the only thing you have left is your identity in Christ. And then you're ready to get involved in people's lives and to love like Jesus. On that Monday, Thursday, Jesus left us two models of authentic love and humility. He left us this table and he left the towel. These two things. The table of the Lord's Supper points us to the cross and it reminds us of just how far Jesus was willing to go to prove God's love for us. And this towel, this basin of water, these are a reminder to us of just how low Jesus was willing to stoop to reach us. all the way from heaven to the soles of our feet. To follow the example of Jesus, to love the way that Jesus calls us to love, stripping ourselves and stooping to serve, we have to start in the same place as Peter. Peter said, Lord, you're not washing my feet. There's no way. You're my master. You're my teacher. You're not washing my feet. Why did he say that? And why did Jesus say it was necessary for him to wash Peter's feet? First of all, it was important that he wash Peter's feet Because Jesus needed to redefine and reprioritize humility. In the ancient world, humility was not as big a virtue. It was not as important a virtue as we like to think it was. It really was not any bigger back then than it is now. But people talk a lot about humility back then. They talk a lot about humility now. But when it comes right down to it, The idea that we are actually stronger when we're on our knees as opposed to standing with both feet firmly planted, that's not something we readily accept. But Jesus knew that Peter needed to know that humility is holy. Humility is powerful. Humility is godly. And humility is the way of Christ. But there was another reason that Jesus needed to wash Peter's feet. 
And that was just to remind Peter that his feet needed to be washed. We know that in the ancient world, the feet are a symbol of our earthiness, of our humanity, because that's what connects us to the ground. It's most likely the part that is going to carry us into trouble. It's most likely the part that's going to get dirty. It's most likely the part that is going to cause us some kind of trouble. Now, I like to think, and we all like to think, that the reason Peter didn't want his feet washed by Jesus was because he felt like, like, oh, well, I just can't do that. I'm too humble already. I can't let my teacher wash my feet. But maybe, maybe Peter just didn't think he needed his feet washed. Is that how we feel? I mean, certainly we, we say that we're sinners. We, we claim the grace of Jesus Christ. We claim the cross. But do we really want our feet washed? I spent, I spent a lot of time building up the dirt on my feet. I worked hard for some of that stuff. Do I really want that washed off? But Jesus says, if you don't let me wash you, if you don't let me clean you, if you don't let me strip you of all that, then you have no part of me. If you do not let me renew you, if you don't let me restore you, then you have no part of me. Jesus said, Peter, you need for me to wash your feet. You need to be cleaned. One of the ancient metaphors that they see, that theologians see in this story, is the, is the metaphor of baptism. That we need to be washed clean in the water of baptism. We need to be washed clean by the blood of Christ, Christ Jesus. The problem is we just don't think we do. And we're not really ready to love like Jesus loved until we're ready for him to wash our feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then Peter, you have no part in me. Peter said, well, then you know what? Wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head, wash every part of me. Because I need it. Jesus gave us this towel and this table to remember that we need him. How far was Jesus willing to go to prove God's love for us? He was willing to go all the way to the cross. How far was, or how, excuse me, how low was Jesus willing to stoop to reach us low enough to reach even me? How far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to stoop to love the way Jesus calls us to love? And are you ready for him to wash you in his blood, in his grace? You have in your bulletin a litany of confession called the solemn reproaches of the cross. This is a prayer that we are going to pray together that confesses that our feet are dirty. That we have walked in ways and we have walked in places where our feet do not belong. And so as we read this tonight, we read this as a prayer of confession. 
We read it as an exercise of humility. We read it understanding that if we ever want to know not only the grace of God and to know the joy that he has promised for us, that we need to strip ourselves of everything that distracts us from him, that paralyzes us, that tempts us away, and that enslaves us. So as we pray this prayer tonight, I just ask you to just feel the Lord stripping away all of those things. Feel the Lord washing your feet so that you can walk from his cross clean and ready to love and be like him. Oh, my people, oh, my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism. But you have prepared a cross for, for your Savior. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood but you scatter and deny and abandon me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. I sent the Spirit of truth to guide you, and you close your hearts to the Counselor. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. And you have prepared a cross for your Savior. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God from the de by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.